What's up YouTube, welcome back. We're going to be continuing the CompTIA Pentest Plus series on Try Hack Me. We finished the pen testing tools section. Now we're going to start the application based vulnerability section. In today's room, we're going to cover HTTP in detail, learn about how you request content from a web server using the HTTP protocol. So let's go ahead and get started. HTTP in detail, there's going to be seven tasks. Open up task one, go ahead and view site. It's just a what it's just a site. It's not a VM, so we don't have to worry about spinning up a VM. Okay, so task one. What is HTTP? HTTPS. So HTTP is whenever you view a website. It was developed by Tim Berners Lee and his team back in 1989, 91 range. HTTP is a set of rules used for communicating with web servers for the transmitting of web page data, whether that is HTML, videos, images, etc. What is HTTPS or Hypertext Transfer Protocol secure? HTTPS is a secure version of HTTP. HTTPS data is encrypted, so it's not only stops people from seeing the data that you're receiving and sending, but it also gives you assurance that you're talking to the correct web server and not someone impersonating that web server. So what does HTTP stand for? Hypertext Transfer, oops, Transfer Protocol. What does the S in HTTP stand for? Secure. On the mock page on the right side, there's an issue. So let's go and see. Let's go ahead and see what that issue is. So as you can see, it's HTTPS. The website loaded with HTTP instead of HTTPS. So we see this lock here with a line going, red line going through it. That indicates that it's not a secure connection. So let's go ahead and click on that, and we get the flag. Task number two, whenever you access a website, your browser will need to make a request to a web server for assets such as HTML images and download the responses. Before that, you need to tell the browser specifically how and where to access these resources. This is where URLs will help you. So what is your what is a URL or uniform resource locator? If you've used the internet, you've used the URL before. A URL is predominantly an instruction on how to access a resource on the internet. The below image shows what a URL looks like and all of its features. So we have the scheme, the user, the host slash domain, the port, the path, the query string, and the fragment. So, so the scheme, this instructs on what protocol to use for accessing the resource, such as HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, to name a few. The user, so some services require authentication to log in. So for example, if you're connecting via FTP, you put FTP colon slash slash user colon password at the host or domain and what port and whatever you're trying to access. So the host as shown is the domain name or IP address of the server you're trying to access. And then the port is the port that you want to connect to. Usually HTTP resides on port 80 and then 443 is where HTTP resides on. So 80, 443, that's where web applications live on usually. But this can be hosted on any port between 1 and 65,535. Path. The file name or location of the resource you are trying to access. So in this example, view dash room is the resource or file we're trying to access. And then we have the query string, the question mark ID equals one. This is the extra bits of information that can be sent to the requested path. For example, slash blog question mark ID equals one. This right here will tell us that the blog path that we're trying to get access to in the article with the ID of one. And then the fragment. There's a reference to a location on the actual page requested. This is commonly used for pages with long content and can have a certain part of the page directly linked to it. So it's viewable to the user as soon as they access the page. Now making a request. It's possible to make a request to a web server with just one of, with, with just one line. The get forward slash ACTP forward slash 1.1. The get is the request method. The page that's being requested is the root directory or the forward slash, and then the HTTP protocol version, which is HTTP 1.1. An example request to break down each line. Line one is the get method requesting the homepage with the forward slash or the root directory, 
and telling the web server that we're using the HTT protocol version 1.1. Line two, host tryhackme.com. We tell the web server we want the website tryhackme.com. Line over line number three, the user agent. We tell the web server we are using Firefox version 87 browser. Line number four, we're telling the web server that the web page that referred us to this one is http colon slash slash tryhackme.com. And then line five, HTTP requests always end with a blank line to inform the web server that the request has finished. As you can see, there is no line five because it's blank. Example response. So this would be an example response. So let's go ahead and break this down. So line one, HTTP 1.1. And the version of the protocol is the version of the HTTP protocol. And it's followed by the status code 200, meaning that it's okay and that the request completed successfully with no errors. Line number two tells us the web server software and version number. So the server is running Nginx version 1.15.8. Line three is the current date time and time zone of the web server. So Friday 9th, April 2021, the time and GMT time zone. Line number four is the content type. So this header tells the client what sort of information is going to be sent, such as HTML, images, videos, PDF, XML. Line number five is the content length. So this tells the client how long the response is. This way we can confirm that no, no data is missing. So 98 is the content length. Line number six will be this blank line over here that we see. It's to confirm the end of the HTTP response. And then line seven through 14, this information, this is the information that's been requested. So in this instance over here, we see it's the homepage for tryhackme. We see it's the homepage for tryhackme.com. So what HTTP protocol is being used in the above example? It's going to be HTTP 1.1. And then now what response header tells the browser how much data to expect? That'll be the content length. Task number three, HTTP methods. HTTP methods are a way for the client to show their intended action when making an HTTP request. There are a lot of HTTP methods, but we'll cover the most common ones although mostly you'll deal with the get and post method in the real world. So the get request, this is used for getting information from a web server. And then the post request is used to submit data to the web server and potentially creating new words. The put request is used for submitting data to a web server to update information. And then the delete request, this is used for deleting information or records from a web server. And then what method would be used to create a new user account? That will be the post. What method would be used to update your email address? That will be put. What method would be used to remove a picture you've uploaded to your account? That'll be delete. And then lastly, what method would you be would you use to view a news article? That would be git. Task number four. Let's go ahead and view site. Okay, HTTP status code. In the previous task, you learned that when an HTTP server responds, the first line always contains a status code, informing the client of the outcome of the request and also potentially how to handle it. So these status codes can be broken down into five different ranges. So one through 199 is the information response. So these are sent to tell the client the first part of the request that has been accepted and they should continue sending the request they should continue sending the rest of the request. These codes are no longer very common though. And then 200 to all the, so 200 through 299 is the success status code. This range of status codes is used to tell the client that the request was successful. Now 300 all the way to 339. So now 300 to 399, this is the redirection. This is used to redirect the client's request to another resource. This can eat, this can be either to a different web page or a different website altogether. Now 400 all the way to 499 is the client error. So this is used to inform the client that there was an error with their request. So client side error. And then 500 all the way to 599, this is the server error. 
This is reserved for errors happening on the server side and usually indicates quite a major problem with the server handling the request. And then common HTTP status codes. There are a lot of different HTTP status codes. That's not including the fact that the application can even define their own. We'll go over the most common HTTP responses that yet you're likely to come across. 200 dash OK, the request completed successfully. 200 dash created, a resource has been created. For example, a new user or a new blog post. 301, permanent redirect. So this, so this redirects the client's browser to a new web page or tells the search engines that the page has moved somewhere else and to look there instead. Now 302 is the temporary redirect. So this is similar to the above permanent redirect, but as the same name suggests, this is only a temporary change and it may change again in the near future. Then we have 400 bad requests. This tells the browser something's wrong or missing in the request. 401, you're not authorized. This basically tells you that you're not authorized to view the web application. 403, forbidden. You don't have permission to view this resource, whether you're logged in or not. And then 405, method not allowed. This tells you that the resource does not allow this method request. For example, if you send a get request to the resource slash create dash account when it's expecting a post request instead. 404, page not found. The page or resource you requested does not exist. And then 500 dash internal service error. The server has encountered some kind of error with your request that it doesn't know how to handle properly. And then 503, service unavailable. The server cannot handle your request as it's either overloaded or down for maintenance. And we have a few examples here. So a 403 request will look like this, 403 forbidden. A 404 error will look like this, not found. And then a 503, service unavailable. Onto the questions. What response code might you receive if you've created a new user or a blog post article? That'll be 201. What response code might you receive if you've tried to access a page that doesn't exist? That'll be 404. What response code might you receive if the web server cannot access this database and the application crashes? So this would be a 503. What response code might you receive if you try to edit your profile without logging in first? So that will be 401. On to headers. Headers are additional bits of da data that you can send to the web server when making requests. Although no headers are strictly required when making an HTTP request, you find it difficult to view the website properly. So common request headers you'll see are the host, which some web servers host multiple websites. So providing the host header can tell you which one you require. The user agent, this is your browser software and version number telling the web server your browser software helps it format the website properly for your browser and also some elements of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS are only available to certain, to, in certain browsers. The content length is when sending data to the web server in such form. The content length tells the web server how much data to expect in the web request. Then accept encoding tells the web server what types of compression methods the browser supports so the data can be made smaller for transmitting over the internet. And then cookie data sent to the server this is data that's sent to the server to help remember your information. Common response headers. So these are the headers that are returned to the client from the server after a request. So set cookie information. In, this is the information to store, which gets sent back to the web server on each request. Cache control. How long to store the content of the response in the browser's cache before it requests it again. The content type. It's, this tells the client what type of data is to be returned via HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, PDF, video, etc. And then content encoding. This tells the browser what method has been used to compress the data and to make it smaller when sending it over in, over the internet. On to the questions. What header tells the web server what browser is being used? This would be the user agent. What header tells the browser what type of data is to be returned? content type and then what header tells the web server which website is being requested so this will be the host task number six cookies 
Let's go ahead and view site. So cookies are small pieces of data that are stored on the computer when a web server sends a set cookie header. They're used to remember who you are, your preferences, and actions on a website. Cookies can be used in the Cookies can be used to store personal settings and website history and are commonly used to track your information in HTTP requests. As you can see, this first graphic shows the client request to the web page from HTTP cookies.thm. The second graphic shows the server response back with a simple web page with the form asking for the user's name. The third graphic shows the client sends back the form with the name set to Adam. As we can see in the highlight, the fourth graphic, the server responds with the set cookie header telling the client to save the data name equals Adam. So set cookie name equals Adam. The fifth graphic, on the next and every further request, the client sends the cookie data back to the server. So the client sending this cookie back to the web server. And then the last graphic, this is the server send, this is when the server sees the cookie data and instead of displaying the form, it displays a welcome back message instead. So it says welcome back Adam. You can use these examples here to view your cookies. So for Firefox, it shows you how to access your cookies via Firefox, and then Chrome, Safari, Edge, and Internet Explorer. Then you have these other sites from before. So which headers used to save cookies to your computer? Set cookie onto task number seven. Now making making requests. So let's go ahead and view the site. Click the view site button on the right. This is an emulator for making demo HTTP requests. Using what you've learned from the above task, you can use it to complete the below questions. So make it get request to slash room. So we're, we have it set to get, let's go ahead and set room and then go. You can see in the body parameters, we see our flag. Now make a get request to the blog. Okay, set blog. And using the gear icon, set the ID parameter to one in the URL field. So for key, we'll put ID, value we'll put one. Go ahead and save it and then hit go. Now we're reviewing blog article one. There's the flag in the response. Oops, wrong one. Third question, make a delete request to user one. So change this to delete user slash one, hit go. In the body parameter, we see the user is deleted in the response. Next one, make a put request to user two with the username parameter set to admin. So put request user user two, and then the username parameter is set to admin. So we can delete the ID username admin, save that, hit go. We see the username changed to admin and there is our, there is our flag in the response. Last question, post the username of THM and a password of let me in to log in. Okay, let's so go ahead and post. Now we're going to specify that as the login. Username is already, or we can go ahead and delete this. The username will be THM. And then we'll set password of let me in. And then we'll go ahead and hit go. And there is our flag in the response. And that is it. Hope you all hope you all learned something about HTTP. I will see you in the next video.